Welcome to Act on Mental Health. My name is Sean, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor here in the state of Indiana. In today's video, we're talking about relational frame theory, which is the science behind acceptance and commitment therapy. We're looking at the building blocks of language and thought, and how we create meaning without meaning to using one of these relational frames. Now on this channel, I've already talked about RFT and explained some of the nuts and bolts of the science behind ACT. Today, I thought I'd take my viewers on an expedition of the history of RFT before Sidman, the founder, was even a twinkle in his father's eye. And then we'll turn our attention to the core components of RFT, and then we'll look at relational frames. Math and history were some of my least favorite subjects in elementary and middle school. Yet these two classic subjects provide the core components of culture and reason. We build the future based on what we know of the past and history, and we calculate our plans for the future based on the laws of math. Relational frame theory is essentially the algebra of language, with X providing the contextual cue to tell us how to write and understand the equation of meaning. Now we'll return to this math of RFT later on in the video, but first we're going way back to the 1800s to learn about the grandfather of RFT. Charles Sanders Pierce is an American scientist, mathematician, logician, and philosopher who is known as the father of pragmatism, along with his friend, William James. Now, logician is the study of logic, which was essentially the study of words, their meanings, and reason. Pierce pioneered a new field of study called semiotics, which is the study of signs. Now, we'll get back to this in a moment, but first, how does this connect to RFT and ACT? Pierce and his friend William James pioneered the philosophy of pragmatism, which was later called functional contextualism, that led to the contextual sciences that acceptance and commitment therapy and relational frame theory have developed from. Pierce isn't a name that most people are familiar with. In fact, I didn't hear about him until I went to graduate school, and even then it was only due to supplemental reading to better understand the philosophy of ACT that I came across his name. But now that you've heard his name, don't be surprised if you get a bunch of suggested videos on your YouTube feed. Now, I have to warn you that it's sort of like Pandora's box, so be aware before you enter. Pierce stood out among his peers in that he viewed language and thought as very much the same and broke down language into symbols that we use to create and share meaning with one another. He went further in making claims about truth based on what he called signs or things that stand in the place of the actual thing, like words, pictures, footprints, paintings, and so forth. If you remember algebra, the addition of symbols into math was new and disorienting, at least for me. The first time I took algebra, I got a 33% in the class. But once I got it, every math course from there was an easy A. You see, math is entirely symbols that carry meaning, by which we could put a man on the moon, or we can know what to tip our waiter or waitress, or we can calculate the probability or chances of our favorite football team making the Super Bowl. Pierce looked at language like math and broke it down to its basic symbols. Now, I tried reading some of his books, and just to be honest, you need a dictionary and a thesaurus by your side and, and stop every two seconds, and I couldn't make it through any of his books. It's just a lot of words that I was not familiar with. Now, William James is a much better writer than Pierce and shared his ideas through the philosophy of pragmatism and how to know truth through language. This had a deconstructive element to the ideas at the time and led to a wave of philosophy concerning language and perception in the 20th century. While Pierce made his mark, he couldn't always communicate his ideas outside of his peers so that the common man could benefit from his work. But we have much to be grateful for due to the work of Pierce and the further elaboration of his work in the formation of the philosophy behind ACT called functional contextualism and the science behind ACT called relational frame theory. Pierce's study of signs called semiotics had an RFT flair to it. Essentially, there's three categories of signs that represent language and cognition, or more accurately, reality in the way that we know and talk about reality. All right, the three categories are icon, symbol, and index. Icons are the physical resemblance to the thing being represented. So think of like a painting or art, like the Mona Lisa. We see the painting of the Mona Lisa, and we know that it was an actual person, but we're not able to go and see for ourselves. We have to kind of take the representation as a stand-in for the real thing. The second category are symbols. Now, symbols have no resemblance between the signifier and the signified. Now, this connection between them must be culturally learned. This is where words come in. 
You know, so think of the word like tree. Now you write it out in T R E E or whatever language that you know tree as. It has no resemblance to an actual tree. But when we say the word tree or we look at the word tree, it's a symbol to us of, that carries meaning. The third category is index or indexing. And these show evidence for the existence of what it refers to. This is where photographs and movies uh, come in. Or you could look at a footprint in the sand. You know that somebody's been there. Uh, but pictures and movies are probably the most, uh, most notable. And that when you watch a movie, you know that it actually took place, you know, and you can see the photograph. You know that something's actually there, but it's not the same as a real actual thing you can see. It's a, it's a representation of it. It shows evidence for it. Now, what's neat about this is Pierce was thinking about this in the 1800s when the field of psychology was in its infancy. Yet Pierce was able to articulate relations between things and how they're represented in our minds without touching them or observing them. Pierce summarized the reach of signs and their usefulness to us, saying the entire universe is profuse with signs if it is not composed exclusively of signs. Another one of his brilliant sayings was, my language is the sum total of myself. And to really appreciate his revolutionary thinking, one needs to learn about relational frames and RFT's elaboration on semiotics, the study of signs. Murray Sidman is the father of RFT, and his work in the 1970s began with this breakthrough in understanding language acquisition, which was named stimulus equivalence. This is written as A equals B, B equals A. Now, this simple equation showed that learning language could occur by teaching the contextual cue, same or equal, which resulted in new learning taking place. You would get both directions, A equals B and B equals A. Now, this underappreciated breakthrough led to more and more trials by training that de demonstrated that scientists could predict new learning using this frame of same equal. This was tested with low verbal adults with learning disabilities, children with autism, and with young children learning to speak. Now, this is so basic to learning that behavior analysis today are required to utilize this in their assessment and treatment with children with autism. Behaviorists at the time were especially excited because this seemed to show that language and thought were behaviors that are learned through operant conditioning or through consequences in the environment. For many in the social science fields of psychology and philosophy at the time, they saw that the mind was separate from the body and brain, and this is referred to as duality. Duality makes it very difficult to do empirical research since the mind cannot be observed directly, rather it's reported by the observer themselves. So much of psychology has been dominated by theories that are no more provable than religious beliefs. You must simply take them by faith which is not science. Back to components of RFT. Now, Sidman and colleagues were able to demonstrate through testing that language is a learned behavior. Thus, it can be taught, but it can also help clinicians to understand when language lags and when development is stunted. Stimulus equivalence refers to the bidirectional sameness equivalence between two relations, A equals B and B equals A. So Mary is the same height as Martha. Therefore, Martha is the same height as Mary. It works both ways. RFT builds on this basic component, stimulus equivalence, and creates the building blocks through derived relational responding, whereas its much longer name says arbitrarily applicable relational responding. Now, this type of relating, among others, appears to be an ability that animals and humans have demonstrated. However, relating things together is limited in animals, as they seem to only be able to relate non-arbitrarily or by their physical and observable characteristics. Our family has a new dog, for example, and she has shown the skill of relational responding. She understands commands like sit and shake and will come when we say come or go to the door when we say potty or prepares herself for a treat when we say treat or this. Audible sounds are related to a behavior that she performs, which is amazing. Now, she'll also take things in her mouth that she's not supposed to have and will play keep away. We didn't teach her this. So learning behavior goes both ways. And we'll say things like come and she won't come. So this is a fascinating thing about how animals learn behavior. Now, what's going on here? Why has the dog's behavior changed uh, when she knows these commands? Well, she's using another relational frame of discrimination and knows what is allowed and what is not allowed to gain something she needs. 
usually more attention. Animals are quite amazing in their ability to use relations to learn behavior, but remember, they're limited to the physical and observable characteristics. Language is complex relational responding that is generalized from a very young age. Now, we are able to do simple relating that animals do, but also with the ability to do algebra and create new and shared meanings through audible signs, written scribbles, and physical movements. This complex algebra of R of T is called arbitrarily applicable relational responding and is another core component in the building blocks of language and thought. Unlike dogs, humans can do psychological jiu-jitsu using the power of their minds and math. We're able to compute complex equations using relational frames. Now we'll talk about these relational frames in the next section, but let's go back to arbitrarily applicable relational responding. You see, this has three core components on which we build language and thought. We have mutual entailment, combinatorial entailment, and transformation of stimulus function. These terms sound much more imposing than they actually are, and they denote quite simple units of behavior which form the basis of all relational frames and derive relational responding. If you remember geometry, there's an X and Y axis that represent the horizontal and vertical lines. And then you have this Z axis that can be used to plot a diagonal line on the graph. Similarly, these three core components tell us what is happening on the behavioral graph when it comes to language and thought. So let's see how this works. This is a core feature of relational framing and involves the ability to relate two stimuli to one another using a contextual cue. Contextual cue just means the frame, same as, opposite, before and after, and so forth. What's neat about these relational frames is that they can go one way, or unidirectional, Mary is taller than Martha, and they can go both ways, Martha is shorter than Mary. Mutual entailment relates two things together and creates a relationship of meaning between two things. It doesn't matter the relational frame that's used there is now a relationship between these two things. This simple building block of relating two things together is arguably the first step to more complex learning and appears to be necessary or a logical step toward acquiring the remaining two core features of relational framing. Think of it like learning subtraction and addition before division and multiplication and before fractions. You need this before you go to the next step. Combinatorial entailment involves a combination of two or more relationships of mutual entailment using contextual cues. Let's take our mutually entailed relationship of Mary and Martha as an example, using the comparison taller than. We can add another mutually entailed relationship that Betty is taller than Mary. Since this is more than two things in a relationship, it is considered a combinatorial entailed relationship. Mary is taller than Martha and Betty is taller than Mary and Martha. We also know the shorter than through derived relational responding that Martha is shorter than Mary and Betty. These combinations are limitless in the forms that they take, so you can add as many relational frames as you'd like. The speed and fluency of doing these relies on previously established learning of relating non-arbitrary or arbitrary events together. Now, this is something seen in toddlers learning to walk. They spent two years learning relational frames so that when words begin to form on their lips, their speech skyrockets going from 20 words to 100 words to 1,000s of words in a matter of months. This is called generativity, and combinatorial entailment permits this learning to take on unlimited potential in creating and sharing meaning. The third component of relational responding is transformation of stimulus function. And this is arguably one of the most crucial components of language and cognition, as it is the means by which language influences behavior. Let me first show you the equation, and then we'll look at how this works in language and cognition. A equals B. B equals C, X equals A. Now in this equation, whatever relational frame network that exists is impacted by X. In transformation of stimulus function, X serves as a specific psychological function. Now let's see this equation written out with an example of a fruit basket. So we have a relational network here where we have three items of fruit. We have apples, bananas, and cherries. Now the presence of X we know is poison. And now this is going to transform the relational network and influence whether or not we try something from this fruit basket, knowing that poison has been introduced to the apples. As you can see here, transformation of stimulus function is an incredibly powerful phenomenon within language and cognition. Now, potentially one of the more interesting manifestations of this phenomenon has been seen with the recent coronavirus pandemic and some of the early misinformation surrounding this novel virus. For example, there was this common misconception that the association between the alcoholic beverage, Corona, 
and the virus corona was the reason why sales of beverage decreased dramatically in March of 2020. This relational frame of sameness, so we have coronavirus and corona, were put in a relational network which transformed the relation, or so it was assumed. Later on, though, after the sales reports came in and better eyes were examining the sales trends, it was noted that the sales decreased in large part because people were not moving around as much, which is celebrate things like the Chinese New Year and St. Patrick's Day. But at the same time, in people's minds at least, it didn't feel right drinking something labeled Corona. Now, there are many examples in everyday lives when stimuli, such as a specific phrase or word, acquire psychological function. Although these stimuli may begin as relatively neutral or innocuous, due to a learning history, these stimuli change when certain phrases are used. For example, the phrase, we need to talk, seems to be fairly innocent. But for a lot of people, this phrase stirs up some feelings of dread and possible anxiety. In fact, if this phrase is said by a boss or a partner, it can result in plummeting feelings within the stomach, a sense of dread, an intense desire to escape the situation. But if this phrase, we need to talk, was spoken to a small child without much of a learning history, this phrase would not have this transformation of stimulus function and wouldn't produce feelings of dread and so on. To review, there's two basic types of relational responding, non-arbitrarily and arbitrarily applicable res relational responding. Relational responding has three core components, mutual entailment, combinatorial entailment, and transformation of stimulus function. In the final section, we're going to look at the types of relational frames and how they influence language and cognition. We begin first with the relational frames of coordination and sameness, because research shows that this is one of the first relational frames to emerge. Coordination itself focuses on relationships of sameness or similarity, not necessarily identical, and focuses on differences or dissimilarities when things are not matches. Now, this frame helps us to have a sense of coherency to events, and especially when communicating. So a lot of early language is naming. You know, this is a road. This is a tree. This is a cup. So that we are all talking about the same thing and coordinating ourselves to those same things. Next, let's discuss the relational frames of opposition and distinction. To be able to notice differences, we first need to be able to coordinate sameness and similarity. And you may be thinking that knowing sameness automatically means that we know the differences, but that's not necessarily the case. A child may be able to match the same, but they may not readily see the differences until they are directly trained to notice them. Distinction gets into the details of how things are different from one another in a relational network. When, th when thinking about differences, we need to consider the dimensions along which these stimuli may be differentiated. So size, shape, color, temperature, and texture. And this sets up learning about opposites. Opposites are fairly straightforward. Now, up is the opposite of down. Laughter is the opposite of crying. Happy is the opposite of sad, you know, and so forth. What's neat about these two frames, though, is that when added to coordination and sameness, they begin to rapidly expand the possibilities of combinatorial entailment and increase a person's ability to relate things complexly. Now, if you've ever been around a three or four-year-old, you begin to see this, that they begin to see connections where uh, we otherwise wouldn't have seen them. Now, up to this point, these relational frames occur more or less in a sequential step. You know, you learn step one, then you move to step two through the process of intentional training. However, next comes the relational frame of comparison, and this is where things get interesting. A wise philosopher once said, we're going to need a bigger boat. And this seems to be the case with comparative relational frames, which are potentially the most expansive of relational frames. Now, up to this point, we know that things are distinct from others. There's a difference. But comparison answers how they are different or distinct, both quantitatively and qualitatively. For instance, we can compare values. A is more than B, or B is less than B, by answering how much more or how much less. Now, we can compare two boxes, you know, one red, one pink, and compare by outlining that pink is lighter than red. The relationship of comparison provides us with a greater depth of detail and specificity regarding two or more relations within our environment. Comparisons can be inexhaustible based on the contextual cues provided. For example, if we were to take an elephant and compare it with a mouse, we could do so by weight, you know, which is heavier, which is lighter. We could do so by size, which is bigger, which is smaller. We could do so by speed, which is faster, which is slower, and so forth. 
These are all quantitative examples. Qualitative would be to compare which would produce more fear in us, an elephant or a mouse. Now this may be quite different from person to person. Next comes the relational frame of temporality or our sense of time. This frame is often blended in with other relational frames, especially when it comes to perspective taking this I hear you position that combines spatial, temporal, and interpersonal relational repertoires. Now, our sense of time is a core relational frame that influences language and cognition a great deal. In fact, we pay attention in great detail to when things occur in time, whether that's our paycheck coming, a package in the mail, or when our in-laws pay us a visit. Time may seem like a fixed concept that is universal, but it's not. Yes, there is a clock that we all live by, and there is also the passing of time from day to day. You know, we have day to night, night to day, but time is not the same to everyone. In ADHD, executive function inhibits a person's ability to hold time in their heads, to plan for the future, hold off rewards, or delay consequences. Everything is now, not later. Temporal relations specify the location between people, things, events on the dimension of time. For example, let's consider the top three finishes of a race. If we know that Kayla finishes the race before Rachel, and we know that Rachel finishes before Christy, the contextual cues of before and after help us to answer the who finished first, second, and third. This could also be considered a relational frame of comparison since we're comparing three runners in a race. Temporal frames are mostly unidirectional, mutually entailed. We know that Kayla finishes before Rachel. We know that Rachel finishes before Christy. That's unidirectional. Similarly, we can say that Thursday is before Friday, but we cannot reverse this and say that Friday is before Thursday. One of the neat features about temporal framing is that it's most connected with intellectual potential. If you can delay gratification of rewards based on the temporal frame, then not now, it correlates to positive future outcomes, higher wages, better health, so forth. This also applies to those who are more musical as they can not only distinguish notes and music, but can hold time and rhythm in place to play the music at the right time. The final two are the relational frames of containment and hierarchy. Now these both are classifications. Now classification is a capacity to organize people, things, or events into specific classes or categories due to their shared physical features or similar functions. Hierarchical classification is slightly more complex form of classification in which classes are further categorized into higher order of classes. For example, we may classify Chardonnay as wine, while also classifying wine as an alcoholic beverage. The ability to categorize and organize things into folders and lists allows us to adjust our behavior in a more strategic and effective manner. Containment frames involve the capacity to relate things using words like in, inside, contains, and holds. These help you to know what is included in the frame. For instance, a child may learn containment frames by opening gifts that have been wrapped. They will learn what's inside the box and whether or not that's what they wanted. Hierarchical frames involve responding to stimuli on the basis of categorical membership, so they're part of or type of. So let's take this food pyramid as an example. Let's say food contains dairy, vegetables, and meat. These are all types of food, yet food contains these types. We could further explore this hierarchy and containment by noting that dairy contains butter and cheese, which are types of dairy, and vegetables contain potatoes and onions, which are types of vegetables, and meat contains sausage and chicken, which are types of meat. Now, how does this apply to language and cognition? Well, there's not a conclusive answer to how these relational frames develop in the course that they take, and there's a lot of research still being done but it seems that they're embedded into language from which thoughts emerge. From an early age, we learn that this is that, that is not this, and from there we skyrocket to more and more complex relations through generativity. What R of T proposes is that these relational frames break down the complexity of language and thought so that we can influence behavior and shape learning. R of T has particular relevance to the work being done with low verbal and autistic children and adults. They start with the coordination frame of sameness and develop this repertoire until they're ready for opposition and distinction and then comparison and so forth. 
Now, as a theory, RFT proposes that these frames are essential to influencing cognition as we learn to transform stimulus function. This is where acceptance and commitment therapy utilizes RFT to help with cognitive fusion, where a person has put themselves in a relational frame of coordination or sameness with a thought or feeling. A fused person may say, I am depressed. This is a relational frame of sameness. And if this influences their behavior, then this will be in a relational frame of coordination and depress themselves further. It would be unhelpful to tell that person to declare, you're not depressed. So say it, I'm not depressed, because that puts them in a relational frame of opposition where they will say or think, I'm not depressed, and the opposite will be there too, I am depressed. And there's no point in talking them out of that thought because this will likely bring them into other relational frames, such as temporal. When I was young, my mother died, and so I'm depressed, which transports them back to that moment in time. ACT helps clients to transform stimulus function through cognitive diffusion exercises that help to create a new relational frame that changes an existing network, such as depression. Now, there's a variety of ways of accomplishing this, but the purpose of this video is to show you the components of language and cognition and the relational frames that can be influenced through ACT. In this video, I've tried to make RFT accessible to a larger audience that may not have the interest or time to research RFT in books and peer-reviewed journals. There's also many people out there who want to know this stuff, but it just hasn't clicked yet for them. It just doesn't make sense. Kind of like that experience that I had when taking algebra for the first time, getting 33% in the class. Now, I don't have all this stuff figured out either, and I have the interest and luxury of time to spend absorbing this information, processing it, and putting it out there for my viewers. Now, if you're interested in learning more, I put a few resources in the description below that influence this video. You're also welcome to email me with any questions or comments or, or make a comment below. As always, remember your journey towards a more purposeful and mindful life begins with a single click.